Cat Williams recently spoke out against countless powerful Hollywood figures in a podcast with Shannon Sharp, and they are not happy. What makes Cat's expose so dangerous is that tens of millions of people around the world believe he is telling the truth. This man is speaking against the evils of this world. Thank you, Cat Williams. This generation is hungry for the truth. Thank you, Cat, for speaking your truth. We absolutely believe you. They canceled me for talking about Harvey Weinstein before the thing came out, but he offered to suck my penis in front of all my people at my agency. Now, a lot of what Cat said in this podcast cannot be proven true or false, but because he he is funny, a good storyteller, and most importantly confident with his words, this allowed him to convince millions that he's telling the truth. Plus, we all know that celebrities don't often speak their true thoughts on the industry or politics out of fear of being cancelled. However, some things he said are just straight up lies. I'm probably reading 3,000 books a year from the time that I'm That's like eight years nine old books a fucking day at uh, 12. My next project was to read the whole encyclopedia set. So when you're like six, seven years old, you read the whole encyclopedia set, you think you're one of the smartest people in the world. So apparently Kat read the entire encyclopedia what? and read eight nonfiction books every single day from age eight to age 12. This is impossible and it's a lie. Throughout this entire podcast, Kat slipped in bold-faced lies, which massively contradicts his preaches of spreading the truth. Nobody knows why liars lie, and that's why I had to come on the program. Cat exists in this middle ground where nobody can really determine if he is telling the truth, if he is lying, if he's telling a joke, if he's on drugs, if he has a mental illness, or if he is clearly exposing the dark and sinister nature of Hollywood. So today, chat, I'm going chat, to give nine books a day. Chat, if I get, chat, I can't read nine pages a fucking day, dude. You as much context as possible so you can make that decision for yourself. Starting with his earliest interview introduction to Hollywood on the set of his very first movie, Friday After Next, where Cat played the role of Money Mike. But in the script, Cat alleged that Money Mike was originally supposed to be violently assaulted. The truth of the matter is, the Money Mike in the original script got raped in the bathroom. Cat Williams had to take the risk in front of the studios and the cast and our powers that be in his very first movie and say respectfully, the problem with Friday After Next is we're trying to make a classic comedy and this comedy involves a rape. and a rape is never funny no matter who it happens to or what the circumstances are if you would allow me to allow us to do this movie without a black man getting raped in it I promise you that it will be twice as funny. Ice Cube, who wrote, produced, and acted in the film, denied these allegations. Second thing I want to clear up. Oh God, that's gonna be a fucking table taken. Chat, guys, it's a table taken because I just rewatched a uh, Pulp Fiction. Guys, I I rewatched Pulp Fiction like like five days ago. Okay, so it's like my brain is like conflicted here, you know. It was never. I would never shoot a seen uh, in a movie, especially like Friday, um, where you actually see this happening on camera. That ain't my style. If you check out any of my movies, they not raunchy. But it's because Kat said things like this throughout his interview caused fans to cast doubt on anyone who denied his claims. These people are not powerful. Satan can't create anything. That includes blessings for his people. Do you know what the number one job of somebody that sold their soul in Hollywood is? What? Is to act like it didn't happen. This is this, they baby. all do the same job. Cat believes he has a more legitimate and honorable legacy than the other comedians he has been associated with throughout his career. These men, Cat says, have formed a gang in Hollywood that actively steal and or blackball young entertainers' careers, which drives them into madness. For 30 years, they're a group. These aren't three random guys. The way that Ricky Smiley kept appearing at all of my auditions is because of Steven said he would tell anybody that, listen, they got a gang on that side. They know what it is. 
They know who the gang is. All of these dudes are co-entwined and they share secrets. And this is the age of truth. And, and, and the truth doesn't need to be scared of the fact that people tell lies. Kat only mentions three of these group members by name, Steve Harvey, Cedric the Entertainer, and Ricky Smiley. But you will notice throughout the video, he makes bold accusations about many other massive stars like Kevin Hart and Martin Lawrence. Are they also a part of the gang? Well, that's up for you to decide. If you sign up for their program, you get a light skin, weird face wife that never do an interview. Oh, in Anyways, let's start with Kat's claim Shut that Cedric the Entertainer and oh, Steve come Harvey on. stole his material. But first, I'm going to steal your attention for just a minute to tell you about today's sponsor. Have you ever Googled your name and seen yourself on one of those strange history? Stop, Steve stop, please, Patrick, please, man. Please, man, Jed, je, bro, just get another sponsor, please, brother. 2000, which at the time was the highest grossing comedy tour in history. Steve Harvey, Cedric the Entertainer, and Bernie Mac playing sold out arenas from coast to coast. The tour grossed over $18 million in its first year. In 1999, both Seagram Americas and HBO sponsored the tour. D.L. Hewley was added and the two year gross exceeded $37 million. And at the exact same time of this tour, Cat was just starting to make a name for himself in Hollywood. He thought that I was just a no-name comedian and that he could take this joke and nobody would know. Right. The issue was that I had already done this particular joke on BET's Comic View twice. This is the joke that Kat is referring to, which was originally performed in 1998 on BET's Comic View program. You ever had your car radio up so loud that you couldn't hear the damn thing when it cut off? It looked like this. You flossing in a six shift convertible. Using physical comedy, Cat mimics someone trying to assess why their car just broke down while the music is blasting. The alleged theft came from Cedric the Entertainer two years later on the original Kings of Comedy tour, which was in 2000. Okay. The premise of Cedric's joke was that white people are obsessed with the moon and space. He says black people are not, but if they gotta go to space, then they would drive the spaceship like this. We drive a space shuttle like it's a 72 deuce and a quarter. And then we, then we... We get us a cigarette, nigga. We get us, we be in a space shuttle, nigga, like it's a 72 dude, nigga. We get us. Now, when you consider the music cue, which is not very common in stand-up comedy, that already looks suspicious. Then the side-by-side -side comparison indicates Cedric makes very similar physical movements that Cat did. Cedric says he did not steal the joke, I mean, and that if Cat was so upset about it, Chad, that that's like that's like saying that like a, a rap music video, they're they're stealing my skit because I, I did the the fucking the whip thing, like. It's like but he had 30 opportunities to speak how, up. How, how else are you going to drive a car? Yeah, like I mean, it was ridiculous. You know what I mean? It was like the idea of the joke that he was even talking about don't even match up with no timeline. So for me, it was one of those things like. Did you have a conversation? Did you guys sell it? Did you have a conversation with Cat? I've seen this guy 30 times. Like, dog, if you literally was that upset about, about it. it like dog just why you, him and say hey yeah hey, why say, you say nothing like that don't even make sense but cat says that cedric apologized about stealing the joke years ago and is now lying to the public that he never stole it in the first place him and steve had already apologized for me so i gave him a pass why would you sit here and be like i talked to i saw cat 30 times why did i give you a pass if you were just gonna lie so imagine how a young cat williams felt seeing his best joke being stolen by one of the biggest comedians in the world on the largest grossing comedy tour in history. We never wrote anything. Remember, when Cedric the Entertainer starts, he's supposed to be singing, dancing, and telling jokes. That's why he's called the Entertainer. He did four comedy specials. They're so bad, Shannon. They're not available on Netflix or Tubi. Noticing all the backlash, Cedric responded to Kat's comments on Instagram. Revisionist history. Regardless of whatever Kat's opinion, my career can't be reduced to one joke Kat Williams claims as his. Cedric added, I'm a grown-ass man, and I none mean, of that 
I don't know. To go like you. Th I, I think he can he can recycle it at least a little bit. I, I I don't think it's that bad. Think, but Cedric is the only one that still Cat's material. Steve or whatever, Harvey's theft know. of Cat's jokes is arguably much worse. At the 2005 BET Comedy Awards, Steve Harvey introduced a hot upcoming comedian to the stage by the name of Cat Williams. Cat hit the stage and absolutely dominated the crowd with his joke about gas prices. Because the world is crazy right now. What is gas? Six hundred dollars a damn gallon right now. I don't care how much money you got. Gas is entirely too high. Used to be, if you put $15 in your tank, you had time to bond with your vehicle. You had time to put the nozzle in and set the clicker and look through your car and clean off the dashboard. Then Steve Harvey did a joke about gas prices three years later in his comedy special, Still Trippin'. Gas, $4 a gallon. Can't even pump gas like you used to no more. $4 a gallon? You remember when you used to go to pump and put the nozzle in there and hit it? Be sitting there talking, be on your phone, hey, what's happening? Be okay, walking yeah, that's around, definitely... Cleaning the windshield. It's hard to see this as anything other than blatant theft. But Kat I mean, that's didn't bar stop for bar, there. Yeah. He continued to expose Steve's long history of suspicious behavior. It started with why Bernie Mac quit the iconic Kings of Comedy tour. Do you consider yourself a king of comedy? They consider that. Oh, that After Bernie left, them same three guys I'm telling you about, the kings, yeah. they came to me. I was supposed to be the fourth king. I got the offer. Then what happened? But I turned it down. Why? Because you shit on Bernie, and I know the truth. You think I'm gonna let you shit on Bernie and then come get me? I'm the next king? You. Now there has been an infamous beef between Steve Harvey and the late Bernie Mac that fans have known about for years. There were often arguments between the four comedians of who should be the closer or finale of the tour. Since Bernie was a much funnier comedian, Steve would get booed by the crowd when he performed after Bernie. Why? Because the whole time Bernie was here you was acting like you was funnier than him. The reason you was supposed to go last is because it was your tour. Tell the truth, it was Steve's tour. Not it was gonna be called the Kings of Comedy, it was Steve's tour. These are the guys opening for him. Of course you gotta close if it's your tour. Harvey eventually just ended up being the host of the tour and not performing a full stand-up routine because he just couldn't make the audience laugh as hard as Bernie. D.L. Hewley, who was also on the tour, even said that Steve never thought Bernie would become successful and when he started getting more opportunities, he became jealous. You feel that the beef between Bernie oh, and Steve Harvey classic, was because uh, Steve Harvey was getting a lot of network love during the time and Bernie Mac not so much? Yeah, and then Bernie started to get it. So yeah, I think that, you know, Steve at one point was, you know, uber successful and then Bernie started to, cause he didn't ever think he would get- Yes, the master of students like, classic, yeah. that's that. super like, classic. Yeah. Kind of knew they would. And he decided to go a different way. Eventually, Bernie got sick of Steve hating, realized his worth and exited the tour, which ended up forcing all four guys to split up. We split up. You wish you would have stayed, kept it together, could have kept it together we, a couple of we, we tried everything, but you know, dudes, felt like they was movie stars. I never saw myself as a movie star. Steve basically claims that Bernie went Hollywood and acted too good for the guys, and Kat didn't like that. Imagine him coming to tell you another story where he got so big and it was Bernie and them's fault because they wanted to be movie stars. What? You called Ocean Eleven to get that nigga's part. What do you mean you didn't want to be a movie star? Allegedly, Steve even called the producers for the heist comedy film Ocean's Eleven to steal the role of Frank Cat. Chat, somehow I got a flashback of fucking uh, of Raj Patel's show, right? And all of his sidekicks or whatever, right? And you know, chat, because I got to give him some props for like um, always recasting the same people or whatever when they had like all their shows and all their whatever and it felt like, like a little bit of self promotion. shit. You, you guys know what I'm talking about a little bit? This interaction, I think I, I can see like similar patterns here. Patton from Bernie Mac. Chat. You don't know who Raj Patel? Oh, forget it then. Oh God. Ocean's Eleven featured a star-studded cast, oh, including George Clooney, Matt Damon, Brad Pitt, Julia Roberts, and Casey Affleck, among others. The film became a huge like critical and commercial and success, and earning over $450 million at the worldwide box office. Having a substantial role in a film of this magnitude helped the rising trajectory of Bernie Mac's career. An infamous GQ article from 2003 released when Bernie Mac himself claimed that Steve was jealous of him from the very beginning. Overall, Kat is obviously upset about Steve stealing material, but ironically, he was more upset that Harvey tried to lie and claim that Bernie went Hollywood on the Kings of Comedy, when in reality, Steve was so jealous of his success that Bernie couldn't take it anymore and quit. And now that he gone, you gonna act like, he wanted to be a movie star. You stop it. 
You stop it. That man was funnier than all of y'all, and y'all thought y'all had one over on him. The king is the funniest. Period. Every time. And that's why no audience member was ever swayed. It didn't matter where Bernie went. You think if Bernie went first, he wasn't the king? <laughs> Get out of here. But Cat Williams and Steve Harvey's beef did not stop there. A few years later in 2008, a show promoter booked Steve Harvey and Cat Williams to co-headline a New Year's Eve stadium show in Detroit. Cat entered his villain arc and challenged Steve to a comedy battle on the Jamie Foxx radio show, to which Steve accepted. You have been the king of comedy as long as we've had one. The second that you get off stage, I need you to understand that that's your final time <laughs> as the king of comedy. I hope you got a team of writers. You're gonna need about six or seven of them. You can bring the nation. You can bring Rashawn McDonald. You can bring everybody who listens to your radio show. They gonna see the truth. And its name is Cat Williams. Consider yourself warned. What was supposed to be just a comedy a show is now some sort of 1v1 battle dubbed the championship of comedy. And Steve responded with this. I'm not saying he's in trouble, but I'm saying this right here, Jamie. A dog... <laughs> Oh no. Don't bark at park cars. Basically, Steve's analogy was that he shouldn't respond to Cat Williams because he is too famous and successful. So on New Year's Eve, Steve got on the stage and never addressed or made fun of Cat. That was a big mistake. Please give up for Steve Harvey one time. Give it up for Steve Harvey. He's an excellent comedian, but he don't want no parts of this in any way, shape, form. Or Jesus. Cat absolutely embarrassed Steve. He claims this was the end of Harvey's career. Steve told you that he stopped doing stand-up because he has seven TV shows. The only problem is when he stopped stand-up, he didn't have those seven TV shows. He stopped stand-up because he got in a comedy battle called the Championship of Stand-Up Comedy with one Cat Williams in Detroit in front of 10,000 people and lost because Cat Williams said he was actually bald and that was a wig. And I went in and that's why he could do stand up anymore. Now, Cat isn't very accurate here. Steve had multiple successful arena comedy tours after the championship battle, and Steve was already bald by 2008, so Cat didn't really expose him for having fake hair. But is it a coincidence that almost immediately after Cat got on that stage and exposed his biggest hater in the industry, he started his crazy downward spiral? In November of 2008, Williams missed an appearance on Conan O'Brien and was later arrested that evening when officers found three handguns in his car while exiting rapper Jim Jones' studio in New York. That same month, he checked into the Mount Vernon Inn in Sumter, South Carolina. Brother. Shortly after checking in, employees reportedly found Williams stumbling around wearing just a bathrobe and a towel wrapped around his head. When police arrived, Williams asked them for directions to the nearest hospital. There, his family convinced him to seek psychiatric help, to which he was eventually hospitalized. He just said that he doesn't trust anyone anymore, that everyone has turned against him. He wasn't really coherent. Pretty much after this, Cat wasn't seen again until 2011. No stand-up performances, That's no tough, movies, huh? no TV. The only time he was talked about was when he was arrested. In November of 2010, authorities arrested Cat in Coata County, Georgia, after he allegedly stole $3,500 worth of coins and jewelry. Things escalated in June of 2011 when he was arrested in connection with an alleged assault on a tractor driver. He supposedly conspired with three women who attacked the man in the his tractor. Project? In 2012, 
Williams returned to the comedy world with his third HBO comedy special, Catpocalypse. Unfortunately, with the spotlight back on him, Cat fell back into a dangerous cycle as the bizarre behavior continued. In October of 2012, Cat and comedian Faison Love got into a heated argument outside of a Hollywood club over a $50,000 debt that Cat owed Love. During the argument, Cat proceeded to pull a gun on Love that wasn't loaded. On November 9th, his former XQC assistant, Melissa Shag, claimed that he went into a rage and attacked her the month prior. Then police arrested Cat in Oakland, California on charges of suspicion of assault with a deadly weapon after he'd allegedly beaten an 18-year-old with a bottle. On November 16th at the Oracle Arena in California, Cat took the stage while having a total public meltdown. For 15 minutes, he what seemed to be under the influence, rambling about nothing while taunting members of the audience. Then the audience began booing him. I mean, he actually got one guy though. On November 17th, 2012, Williams got involved in a police chase while driving his three-wheeled motorcycle and failing to stop. Just a week later, Cat was arrested in Seattle, Washington after he allegedly got into a dispute at a bar in the South Lake Union neighborhood. His arrest came after he missed the first night of a planned two-night performance at the Paramount Theater. That same month, he slapped a Target employee in Sacramento for no apparent reason, which was made fun of on late-night television shows like Conan O'Brien. On December 28th, Wait, Williams fuck, was yeah? placed in handcuffs once again on child endangerment charges. But I'm sure you all get the point. He was spiraling hard for years, seemingly strung out on drugs or at least experiencing manic episodes. The media called him crazy, a crackhead, and didn't believe anything he was saying since they wrote him off as a madman. But he says he was never under the influence. I am never under the influence influence of anything and I'm always in my right mind I'm always a physical specimen and when you see me I'm much much bigger than you had thought I have far less play in me than you would like there seems to be a pattern with comedians in the downward spiral. In 1990, Richard Pryor, who struggled with addictions to women and hard drugs, poured high-proof rum on himself and set himself on fire. His widow, Jennifer Lee Pryor, claimed it was a drug-induced attempt at ending everything. In 1997, Martin Lawrence was coming off the end of his hit sitcom, Martin, as well as starring in the blockbuster film, Bad Boys. That year, Lawrence allegedly had a meltdown in Los Angeles where he ran into Ventura Boulevard with a gun and threatened tourists and random people. Sources claim Martin began taking psychotropic drugs and having violent outbursts on the set of his movie, oh, no. A Thin Line Between Love and Hate. Martin would continue his erratic behavior, getting arrested for gun possession and later going to rehab. Robin Williams openly spoke about his lifelong battle with addiction, alcoholism, and depression. Comedian Mark Maron has spoken publicly about having severe depression. Artie Lang and Jim Norton as well. John Belushi, Chris Farley, and Greg Giraldo all died of drug overdoses. It's unclear why comedians seem to struggle with mental health more than others in the entertainment industry while being tasked with creating the most light-hearted content. Deborah Sarani, a clinical psychologist who treats performers with depression and other mental health problems, said comedians often wear what we call the mask of depression, which helps them put on a more acceptable face to the world. But behind that mask, there is a terrible struggle going on. There is a stigma about depression, and oftentimes the laughter distracts from feelings of weakness. Cat Williams has had an extremely rough life, starting with being homeless and alone at age 13. Combine that with the chaotic lifestyle of a comedian, constantly being on the road, late nights, irregular sleeping Sanch. and eating schedules, the pressure to constantly deliver funny and engaging performances, as well as regularly dealing with hecklers and sometimes unresponsive Damn. audiences who make the job mentally taxing. And on top of all of that, add the potentially evil Hollywood gang that Kat says is actively trying to get him to compromise his morals, but when he refuses, they blackball him and run smear campaigns to call him crazy? That is a recipe that would make any man but. go mad. 
bad. So the I question is, was Kat trying to escape an evil industry or was he actually a drug induced madman? Martin tried to put me in my first dress. When he, he had both on his hiatus, he tell me, Kat, when I come back, I need you. You my young partner, you my brother in comedy. When I come months. back, just wow. promise me that my next movie, it'll be me and you. Go do what you gotta do. When you come back, I'm in your movie. Don't trip. I don't need to see the script or nothing. You know we get in that office and this fool pull out Big Mama's house too. Where this nigga want me to get in a dress with him. And I'm literally saying to everybody, why is he in a dress again? If it isn't obvious, Kat didn't want to wear the dress. Brandon T. Jackson would go on to portray Martin's son, Trent in Big Mama's house, where the two go undercover at an all-girls performing arts school. Unfortunately, years later, Jackson asserted that he did the project for money and was unaware of the repercussions it would have on his career. Did you get, like, slack when you wore the dress at that moment? Only Cat Williams. Cat Williams was trying to always say, Brandon, Brandon, don't wear a dress. <laughs> you know, he called you, or is this... No, he was saying it in the media, so I thought he was heckling me. He was really trying to help me. At the time, I didn't know that. I was immature. Right. So I feel like, dang, why? I'm trying to, uh, just trying to make it. And then he was trying to warn me, you know, don't get in the dress. Everything went wrong. He's like, everything went right. Everything went wrong when I put on that dress. Welcome Kat has been discussing this subject for years because this has been a pattern that many have I'm speculated confused. is a humiliation ritual. Eddie Murphy, Tyler Perry, Jamie Foxx, Wesley Snipes, Chris Tucker, Arsenio Hall, Tracy Morgan, the Waynes brothers have all dressed up as women for TV or movie roles. Just before Kevin Hart exploded into fame, he also wore a dress on Saturday Night Live. And even 10 years ago, Kat discussed this. It, it's two answers. First of all, let's be very, very clear. It is possible that there isn't anything funnier than a guy in a dress. And if that's the case, then it might also be said that there's nothing funnier than a black guy in a dress. Okay, well, Kevin doesn't have to worry about what people are going to say about him wearing a dress because of the long line of dress wearing people before him. <laughs> so now some of us are against the I'm Illuminati. I'm confused. We are against the Illuminati at our own detriment. When people are against the Illuminati, then they get punched in the face all the time. The Chad, I feel like this point, Chad, like this whole like Illuminati thing and like uh, this whole thing is like, it's like, I believe like, like Elo Hell or like the friend zone. It's like they, they make it exist and it exists for them because they quit its existence. But like, look at this, look at this picture. It's almost like a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, thoughts with it? What is that? Who is this? Who is that? It's kind of sexy. But you got facial hair on that. The ritual. Damn. I don't remember this. I don't remember this. Is this me? Interesting. The, the ritual. This hates him. Nobody likes him. Kat also detailed an Illuminati meeting alongside Ludacris. There was a crossroads where we were both invited to an Illuminati thing and decisions had to be made. So it was both of us, we were equal. One of us had to cut off all their hair and couldn't do the sideburn thing no more with the points. And the next person they said was going to get $200 million because they were gonna pay him 10 million a movie to do 20 movies. And that's how the conversation happened. One of those persons turned out to be ludicrous and the other person turned out to be Cat Williams. It's really hard to back up any of Kat's claims. And even if the stipulation of getting a $200 million deal is that you have to shave your head and sideburns, that seems like an extremely small compromise. And there are no indications that Ludacris ever sold his soul. I mean, he will tell you, he responded to Kat with a rap song. Never been Illuminati, only Illuminati, and I only left with bitches when coming from any party. Afro with the sideburns, yeah, that's my signature. Addictions on the rise, comedians check your temperature. Perhaps Damn. the most overlooked comment Jesus, during the interview was Kat's take on Kanye West. I suspect that we're pretty awful people. He's gonna cringe, but I think it was a pretty decent bar at the end. Somebody got a mental illness, and then we watch what they do. If you say somebody got special needs, then why would you be watching them and holding them accountable like everybody else? 
The question of whether someone's actions should be judged differently due to mental illness is complex and multifaceted, and opinions may vary depending on cultural, ethical, and legal perspectives. Mental sure. illness can significantly impact an individual's ability to understand the consequences of their actions, to make rational decisions, or to control their behavior. Kat is not excusing Kanye's behavior, and he definitely says he doesn't agree with what he says, but he's just questioning why people are surprised as his whole career he gave obvious signs, such as claiming that he was a god, and he was praised and uplifted for his outlandish behavior. Now Kat has never publicly disclosed any sort of manic or psychiatric problems, but look at how much the world judged him when he was crazy 10 years ago. Versus now, he is saying the exact same things he was saying while he was now, crazy, free. but today he is more calm, coherent, and of course, entertaining. Now they are quoting his words as prophetic statements of a wise old genius. Funny how things change. Interesting. I don't, I, I think they're looking at went in circles. There wasn't much of a conclusion to this. I feel like 